Back in my uh, college days, I had the opportunity to travel through Europe and uh, all over, and it's kind of interesting when the Olympics arrive and they have the parade of nations, and you're going, where are these, uh, these new nations that they've got? Because, you know, Macedonia was part of Yugoslavia. I was in Yugoslavia, not Macedonia, but apparently it's Macedonia these days. Um, and I was in the city of uh, Skopje, and uh, Skopje has a, had a young girl who grew up there, and, well, Anya's Boyagachka, and she was, well, she didn't want to do like the typical girl things, like her mother wanted her to learn to cook and to sew and wear dresses and act like a girl. She was more tomboyish, and so she really struggled with that. And one of the things that, in her life, that she really wanted to do was that their, the church in town, they would at Christmas time always have a huge Christmas pageant. Now, if you think about the characters in a Christmas pageant, if you're a girl, as she was reminded of when she would step forward to volunteer for various parts, no, you may not be a wise man. That's a job for a boy. No, you may not be Joseph. That is a job for a boy. You can be an angel. There you go. Unless, of course, and they always chose one of the new mothers with their newborn to play the part of Mary and the infant. So, as she was told, you have your choice. You can be an angel. Because you can't be a shepherd. That's a job for a boy. Joseph is a boy. You know, the, uh, when they came out to make the announcement, the decree for the Emperor Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled and be taxed. That, of course, was a job for a boy as well. And then the Roman centurions, that's really what she wanted to do, is that accompanied this messenger you know, with their, their plumed helmets and the, 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 the leather cuirass and the flowing red cape. And the, the best part, of course, was the, the Roman legionnaire Spatha, that short three-foot thrusting sword. They'd be wearing, yeah. <laughs> Uh huh. Of course, in Roman times, when an official message came from the emperor, from the senate, that they would arrive, and the message was wrapped around a column of marble that had been hewn from one of the mountains there in Rome, a symbol of Rome, accompanied by legionnaires who would step forward and draw their spatha up, as in you better pay heed and listen because the empire is dictating. Well, when she was 13, Agnes, well, perhaps I think she might have thought a miracle happened. The flu hit the town. And I mean, everybody was sick. And it was Christmas Eve and they were supposed to be putting on the pageant and shepherds were throwing up all over the place. Joseph was indisposed. So last minute changes that evening were going on and Anya stepped forward when she realized that all four of the boys who were supposed to be the Roman centurions were not there sick. And she found one of the, the uniforms of a Roman legionnaire that fit her. She put it on and of course, the director of the pageant was looking going, yeah. but at that point, okay, okay, you can be a Roman centurion. She was thrilled, finally getting to be who she wanted to be. Well, Christmas pageants and working with, with youth, they don't necessarily go smoothly when everybody's well and healthy and everything's going on. They kind of forget what they're doing, their lines, their cues, that kind of stuff like that. Shepherds like to use their crooks like swords. Um, so this pageant was going kind of chaotically, and it finally reached the point where Agnes was supposed to escort the, the messenger from Rome out, and they came out to the, this artificial rock that they had built up there where he'd stand and declare from the Emperor Caesar Augustus, and she drew her spatha out, her glorious moment she had waited for for years. And right below her, Somebody had miscued the Holy Family, Joseph, Mary, and the Christ child. 
And she realized all of her desires, all of her me first, was nothing but drawing a sword on the Christ child. And she stood there trembling. Her will, not his. She was greatly disturbed by this for the next few years. Eventually, Agnes would join a convent. She would be sent to Ireland. In time, she would end up in Calcutta. One of the things, of course, when you join a monastic order is you, you leave your old self behind. and You become a new person. So one of those things that you do is you take a new name. So Agnes ceased to exist, and she took the name Teresa. Eventually, at one point, she would, of course, rise to the rank of Mother Superior. Mother Teresa. Perhaps this morning's gospel was the inspiration for her. You see, Jesus goes up to the northern region. He knows that that area up there is filled with foreigners, non-Jews. He knows he's going to run into that Syrophoenician woman begging for help. On the surface, it seems like a cold and callous Jesus. Oh no, I can't help you. You're not one of us. He's waiting, waiting for the words of, of wisdom from her. Indeed, God's word, even crumbs coming to anybody, is food, life-changing. And when he goes to Sidon and heals the man who is deaf and has speech impediment, Jesus reaching out and touching those in need. This is Mother Teresa's life reaching out and touching those in need, bringing even crumbs, God's word, God's faith, God's love, to those that even in their society were untouchables. And yet, Mother Teresa left us with a wonderful word. In this life, we can, cannot do great things. We can only do small things with great love. In this life, we can only do small things with great love. The love that God has touched us with and calls us to treat those around us with that same love.